So we're going to get started this evening. First, um, I'm from Montreal. I live in Montreal now, originally from Toronto. So I really want to thank everybody for coming out in the storm of the century. Um, yeah, I know it's tough here to get out in the snow, but uh, but glad everyone was able to make it. If I forget at the end, be very careful going home. You know, the roads will be slippery, so um, everyone take uh, extra care. So I'm Claude Reeves. I run the enterprise business here in Canada for Red Hat. Part of the Red Hat team, been here about seven years, and I'm absolutely not the focus of the meeting today. Okay, so I'm just going to speak for a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to give it over to the people who really have some great things to say about DevOps, about how the world is changing, and, and how everyone in this room can actually impact their businesses in a positive way by accepting that change and taking it. So first things first, Intel. I bet you didn't expect me to mention Intel first. Intel's a big reason why we're here today. They helped sponsor this event, and they've been working with Red Hat for years helping get this message out, this message among others. And over the years, we all know Linux is what it is because of Intel. And Intel is what it is because of Linux. They're tied very, very tightly together. So very, very much want to thank um, the Intel team for helping us put this together. Um, as everyone knows in this room, the world is changing. Whether, whether we call it digital transformation, DevOps, um, you know, agile business practices, all that sort of stuff. The world is changing and Red Hat believes, we fundamentally believe that our role is to enable people to change. We're not going to tell you what you have to do. We're not going to dictate, you know, the end, the end goal. Our goal is to enable our customers through what is a pretty foundational change in our industry and in business in general. And we could even go beyond that, as in, the, in Gene Kim's The DevOps Handbook, they talk about how the, it's changing the world, not just our business and IT. So to that goal, Red Hat has put this together, but our goal is also we do webinars, workshops, um, lots of things and that are not about sales, okay? They're about enabling our customers. Whether you're using Origin as a community project on the DevOps side, um, whether you're a contributor to the community, to any community, whether you're going to workshops, however you want to be enabled, we're going to try and be there with you. And the biggest thing is Red Hat is an open source company, right? So our goal is, is that everyone in this room sees the value of open source. Whether it's our open source, whether it's projects we're involved in, whether it's other projects, just get involved in projects. And we're very, very happy. We feel that we've done part of our goal, which is to get everybody involved in open source and see the value. All right? So with that, a couple of things I want to mention. A lot of things are going to be discussed today. Red Hat has a lot of resources available to everybody, whether that be our services, POCs. Um, we have Tiger teams that will help you pre-sales, not asking for you to buy anything. We have innovation labs. We have tons of knowledge online. A lot of, cust a lot of you are customers of Red Hat, and you're probably only scratching the surface of what's possible in, help in, in, um, in how Red Hat can help you and the information available. So please reach out to the Red Hat team. Would everyone who's with Red Hat just hold up your hand quick? Reach out. Reach out. There's a lot of them. Um, they're all standing, which is a good thing. Um, so reach out to one of them if you have any questions at the end. Gene will be here afterwards. Diogenes will be here after as well. So with that, that's all I have to say on that subject. So I'm going to introduce Diogenes. We've actually worked together a few times now. Diogenes is the principal product manager for Red Hat for OpenShift, our key container and DevOps solution. So with that, I'm going to give it to Diogenes. There you go. Funny words about Intel is that uh, once the CEO of Intel said that uh, so hardware without software is just heat, right? But it, I can say as well that software without hardware is just words, right? So that's, a, that's good to see the two things coming together, right? Intel has been a great part of Red Hat's success, especially through uh, the x86 architecture. So thank you, Intel, for sponsoring this event. Uh, very good. I'm going to talk to you about uh, what I call DevOps in real life. And it's real life because, yes, I'm going to mention a real life use case of a customer that uses uh, DevOps, 
but I'm also going to talk that uh, there are human aspects to DevOps. It's not only technology. It's a lot about technology, but it's not only technology. And how can technology make really our lives better, right? And the life of uh, your colleagues better, and your lives better as well, right? So again, this talk is not only about technology, uh, but it's also a lot about people and people working in technology. I'm actually not going to talk about containers right now. I know every single talk in the last, I don't know, 12 to 24 months, people have to address containers. Like it's like a word that you have to say in the talk. So there, I said the word container is good, but I'm not going to talk about it, right? <coughs> I'm going to talk about another thing, which is anxiety, right? Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting. Uh, we don't know, but I think between, uh, if we have a room of between 10 to 20 people, sorry, 100 people here, I think, we have between 10 and 20 people here that they actually have, that they have like uh, diagnosable anxiety mental disorders, right? So have that in mind. No, no, that's a serious thing. That's a very serious thing. In this room here, we have about 20 people that have diagnosable anxiety mental disorders. So, so this, it's a very serious subject. And we tend to forget that in IT, right? We think, oh, anxiety is a, is a big problem for people working, uh, like for, med, for, for doctors, right? Anxiety is a big problem for people, let's say, operating uh, airplanes, but it's not. In IT, it's also a very important problem. So have that in mind, right? Uh, so <clears throat> the number is 18%. 18% of humans above the age of 18 uh, years, they have diagnosable anxiety problems. So have that in our mind, right? There's one thing about anxiety, though, is that uh, not all anxiety is bad, right? So if we haven't feel anxious about anything, we would likely have not accomplished anything in our life. Like if we just lived our lives laying back doing nothing, not worrying about anything at all, like humanity wouldn't be <coughs> at the stage we're at right now. So it's important, like anxiety, uh, some people here in this room have it, uh, some in higher levels, some in others, but again, not all anxiety is a bad thing. Uh, there's a, actually this very interesting law from, uh, just know this thing, this is, uh, who uh, said this is a professor of the Boston University called David Barlow. This law is from another two professors from, from Harvard. It's, they call the Yerkes Dodson law. And this is what the law says, right? The law says that According to the simplicity of or the complexity of the task you are executing, right? anxiety or arousal or let's say uh, alertness or let's say excess of excitement can be a good or a bad thing. Right? And uh, there's a story about a baseball player that before every single game he would uh, throw up. Before every single game he would throw up. There are documented cases where he threw up more than 1,000 times before every single game. Right? But for this player, throwing up was a liberating thing. The games that he threw up, he played better than the games, the games that he didn't throw up, right? So that's important that we realize that not all anxiety is bad. It's, there, there's, there's a, this curve tells you where we should be, right? <clears throat> and where uh, tasks start to become complicated. There's also a good uh, a book from a, a, a professor at the University of Chicago that talks about chokers. Yeah, people that on a, uh, on a, when they are about to make a very complex task, they choke, they don't know what to do, they stop, they don't know how to react. So that person, that professor, I have the name if you want to search later, studied, studied chokers in professional athletes. Like what was the result of people that were tasked to do very complex tasks uh, and they, they just couldn't do it, even though being professional, even, doing, even though doing it many times, right? Um, and funny to see, to see that uh, most of the researches that I found around anxiety come from, come from Boston, right? And <laughs> this is just a funny note, right? Maybe the fact that they stayed 86 years without winning a, a World Series helped with the, the anxiety, just saying. But it's, it's interesting. Actually, lots of the researches are at Harvard and Boston University, right? So again, let's go back. So anxiety can become a problem, like high levels of anxiety can become a problem with complex, unfamiliar, or difficult tasks, right? So have that in your mind. And this is what happens. When our level of arousal, right, maybe in 
1913, when they created the law, the word arousal likely had a different meaning than it does today. But it's essentially alertness, excitement, right? So for complex, unfamiliar, and difficult tasks, as your excitement or anxiety arousal increases, your performance decreases. Right? And now you may be asking, like, what's, uh, and I'm sure Claude is very nervous, like, what is this guy talking about here? I'm sure his anxiety levels are, are very high right now. Don't worry, we'll get there, right? So how, how can we make a parallel? How can we try to improve our, our lives? Because, again, statistically, we have people here with these problems. And at your companies, just imagine, if you have 100 employees in IT, that means that, according to statistics, like around 18 of them have serious anxiety problems, right? And they are working for you, right? And then you don't want, you, you want them not only to be performatic in what they do, but you want them to also have a good life, right? Um, <clears throat> so this, this other number is very, it's very important. And I'm sure you're gonna guess it wrong, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. What percentage of downtime you actually think it's caused by a technical failure or a natural disaster? Just guess. Like, guess low. <laughs> Sorry? Less than 30. Less than 30. So let's do exactly in the middle, between 10 and 20%. <clears throat> so see, 20% of downtime is caused by a technical failure or a natural disaster, right? So it's interesting that we spend a lot of money buying a redundancy for everything when the likeliness of a problem occurring, it's it's not in technical failure, right? It's, it's caused by a, a, a essentially a people, a people problem. Some, someone did something wrong. And that's why I say that we have to acknowledge this, right? And that if our performance is gonna go down, right, likely we're gonna have these numbers going up. And if the environment you are favors anxiety, favors complex tasks and familiar, or tasks that, can, that cannot be automated or reproducible, this becomes not only a business problem, but it becomes a human, a individual problem, like as, as a person, you know? So, yeah, 80% by some poor little dude, right? So, now, let's, let's talk a little bit about technology, right? What can we do, right? So, let's, let's think that there is a way to use technology to make people's lives better and to make yourselves and your companies more performatic in what to do. And this, this way is, let's find a way to reduce anxiety. Let's, let's, let's find a way to reduce the tasks in our day to day that, that favor anxiety, that create more anxiety, uh, with the objective of, of uh, increasing performance. So if we want to be, let's say, very selfish and think only from a perspective that this is good for my business, I hope, you're not, I hope we're not doing this, right? But it, there is already advantage in that. So it's not only good for business, this is good for people, for humans, right? Um, and in order to talk about what uh, can be done in technolo technology with this, and I have no idea how I am with time because I forgot to start my watch. Uh, so I have to talk about batch size. For some of you, if we have people that are very deep into the woods, into technology, you probably know this, this is no news, right? So the batch size is essentially uh, the amount of change you introduce in a system or in an application at a time, right? So in this example, my batch size is five UI features, six bug fixes, two database changes. So this is my batch size, right? So for this, let's say, example scenario here, I'm gonna introduce this amount of changes, right? And just the DB changes, I know the database changes, when we hear like, oh my God, database changes, then anxiety levels go very high. Uh, we are, one of our uh, colleagues at Red Hat is writing a book on how to relate microservices, DevOps, and database changes, because that's a, it's, a, it's a very complex problem, right? How can you achieve agility if you're dealing with data that cannot be changed, data format that is hard, that's hard to change, data that, because data is a virus, right? Data starts to proliferate. Um, and now this is a, a real use case. So there's this bank, and for this bank, what they had is that their batch size was three months. Now, three months, right? So three months of expectations 
<clears throat> that they wanted to put into production. And it's very sad when I hear that for, for companies, their expectation size or their batch size or their anxiety size, it's more than three months. It's six months. It's accumulated in six months. It's 12 months of accumulation in anxiety that you want to put into production, right? So for this case, what we have is it's, it's three months, right? The, the name of this bank is Key Bank. It's a public case. Uh, you can look for it later. But this is, the, this is their use case, right? So this is what happened. Like after the result of, of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> three months, right, the developers, they would come up with a package that's composed, of course, like source, uh, source files, compiled files, configuration files, and lots of things. And we'll hand it to a ops team and say, it was a very nice to deliver this to you. I'm going to go back to my home, to my family, uh, to my friends, to play my video game. I play myself Battlefield 1 a lot. Uh, and what happens now, right? Now ops, what do they have to do? They have to take this three months of expectation and they have, if they're lucky, lucky a weekend to realize that three months of expectation is something useful, right? Uh, this creates a disparity between devs and ops, right? And it's the problem that I called, I hate devs. We're going to talk a little bit about this because I, 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 I sneak peeked into your presentation, so I hope I'm not stealing your mojo. But how can you love someone or how can you have a good relationship with someone in your team if that person is screwing you all the time? <laughs> And it's, it's, it's really what happened, right? Uh, so developers would, would, would finish their work, right? Would finish their work. Three months are worth of work. Six months are worth of work. QE will test, it will go. And then it will be handed to a different team. And this team has to figure out, has to realize all that value, all that, that, uh, that uh, money that is, was translated from like, actual, actual cash into code, right? Has to make that change to be realized, like it's just like you're about to sell your stock and get money out of it in a week, right? And it's a real problem, right? And then it, and this is where anxiety becomes an even more bigger problem because the ops knows that developers, they have no idea about production, right? I myself, I've been a developer most of my life and my bad days was when I had to stay like up late coding, uh, some boring stuff. Uh, and this was a bad day. But think that a traditional ops that does deployment, like bad days almost every day, you know, because that's the work, right? Uh, and often developers would say it works on my machine, right? So, so long, it works on my machine, right? <laughs> I mean, it worked on my machine. Uh, and of course, I, uh, ops also hate devs because they devs, they keep making changes. They keep changing all the time. These changes, they break things. And who has to fix? Who has to stay late? Right? Who has to stay the night? Who has to execute the rollback plans? The rollback plans, is it the developer? No, it's not a developer, right? So this is an actual problem. How do you expect that there is going to be a good relationship between the two teams? if one team is always the one that has to stay late, has to say no to their families, right? This is, this is a real problem, right? Um, I hate devs, yes. I don't hate devs, actually. I'm a dev myself. I'm, possibly I hate ops, no. Uh, <laughs> anxiety size equals batch size, right? So this is a very important thing. And if I want, if, if there is any message that I want you to leave this, this room here, is this, right? Is that, you are the level of anxiety from your ops team, and that will likely decrease in performance. It's, it's, it's equal to the amount of changes you're making at a time in a system, right? That's the mathematic. The level of anxiety, it's equal to the amount of changes you're making at a time in a system, right? So this is, this is again, explaining it better, right? Uh, we have uh, the higher the batch size, the higher the complexity, Right? Because if I have a batch size that's big, I have more stuff in it. So the changes of becoming more complex are bigger. Uh, <clears throat> it's not only a bigger batch size is a problem in complexity, but it's a problem when you roll back things. Right? One of the changes applied, was applied correctly. The, the, the other wasn't. 
what do I roll back? I roll back everything. I roll back just one. What do I do? Anxiety raises, performance drops, right? Risk as well in anxiety and as a result is performance. So again, if you're only thinking this from a business perspective, right? Uh, figuring out a way to reduce batch size or essentially to put things into production faster, it's good for your business and it's good for humans. Now, I want to go back to this thing here. How many of you, which is another problem that happens, how many of you remember what you wrote October 24th? <laughs> you don't, right? Developers, they don't remember as well, right? So there's another very important aspect here that you lose the feedback loop, right? You want to be constantly making changes. You want to be constantly telling developers that uh, these changes, they were good, they were not good, right? And if you have a three month span, you lose the feedback loop. I don't remember what I wrote three months ago, but I do remember that I, like a week ago, I, the things that I do, the things that I did, right? If I briefly take a look at my calendar, I'll pretty much be able to figure out what happened, right? I'll likely, if I really force myself, I'll likely even remember the things that I ate last week, right? And let's not think that it's the same, it's different with developers. I forget what I write. Three months after I wrote code, three months after I wrote a script, I do not remember anymore what it was about. Because remember, I have to worry about the next task, right? So we're not only including uh, three months over expectations in a batch size, but we're also losing our ability to take advantage of a tighter feedback loop between what's, what's running and who's developing what's running, right? So, so this bank here, <coughs> they, they uh, reduced from three months to a week. And among other things, technology things, right, I have to say that there was one person, one human willing to do the work. We need to fight the fight because this is what happened, right? You would go to uh, your, your ops person and you'll say, oh, I need you to, to execute this faster. And he said, no, our process says that you have to send a ticket and we have 48 hours to respond to our ticket, to respond to our ticket, not to necessarily execute our ticket, right? So uh, this person is tied to identify every single area in the organization that could have, uh, could uh, benefit of improvements in the process, right? Again, this is again talking to people, talking to people, talking to people. You cannot enforce this. It's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna work. Um, and <clears throat> this is where the part where maybe Claude is a little bit more relaxed because I'm actually talking about the product almost at the end of my presentation. This is the thing I wanted to buy, by the way, okay? <clears throat> but I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened, right? So the way KeyBank uh, achieved this three months per week, it's not only, it's not only uh, let's say, a culture change, but it's also a technology change. And there are certain technologies that help you create or even f almost, uh, I wouldn't say the word force, but they create strong incentives to adopt a DevOps mindset. And I'll tell you why, right? So one thing is that OpenShift, any, any application that runs in OpenShift uh, runs in Linux containers, Docker containers, right? And to explain containers in a word, uh, in a phrase, is that it's essentially uh, a sandboxed process, right? So I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm executing something inside the operating system, but there is someone limiting what I can do, right? Limiting what? Amount of compute power that I have, or memory that, uh, memory that I can utilize, or CPU power, or I.O. power, essentially these three, right? So I am essentially an application running inside an operating system, but I have constraints, right? That is good because my neighbors, my other applications, they cannot affect me, and I can't affect them, right? So it's most, much like we have a virtualization, but now you don't have the overhead of the operating system in each virtual machine. You have one operating system and just the processes, they are now isolated. One of the direct benefits we have this is density. You have just uh, more applications per, per, per infrastructure. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what they did, right, uh, at KeyBank. And this is me as a dev. Just think of me like myself when I was a developer, and this is my story, right? As a developer, ops hated me automatically, right? Because I was dev. Uh, is that I was a Java developer, even to today I still develop in Java. And the result of my 
work, <coughs> my work as a developer, was mostly a .eAR file. That means an enterprise archive for Java applications, right? There are other examples. Some can be zip files, some can be RPM files. But this was me as a developer. This was the result of my work, right? The result of the development process would produce an archive, uh, and that's it. Development was done, right? Very good. You send it over to QE, but development was done, right? So this is the language I spoke. I always spoke to this level, right, to this archive here. And if you understand Java, this will help you, right? But it's essentially, I would give part of the application. Now, since this application was a Java application, right, it needed a few things to run, right? We all know that most Java applications, they need a, a Java application server. So in that case, someone was doing the work to manage the Java application server, not me, Oof, of course, right? I'm a developer, right? And someone was doing the work to figure out Java, right? Uh, and Java itself, in either Windows or Linux, it has so many dependencies that you have no idea, right? Uh, so just one example, uh, there was a, 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 a attack uh, last year, I think a drone attack that affected a library in Linux, and affected a library in Linux that my application had nothing to do, but it's a dependency of Java. So it turns out that like my application was also impacted by that, that uh, vulnerability in the library. So this is an important thing, right? If you think I'm doing Java and I have to worry about nothing else, well, maybe if you are a dev, you have to worry about nothing else. But your ops guy or girl, uh, she has to worry about lots of other things, right? So this is what I would do, right? And this would be essentially ops, right? They would take my ear file, magically created, and they would put it on top of the application server. Sometimes they would put lots of ear files in same, uh, on top of the same application server. And they will have to deal with the application server, the Java configuration, the operating system, the network, lots of other things. But my job as a developer was done. So this here, that arrow that you see there, that error is a wall. It's not an arrow, it's a wall, right? So the thing that the expectations from the different teams are different, right? I'm, I, for me, if I think that the result of a development process is just that thing, I'm creating a wall between the teams, right? And now, ops know that just that, that file, that ear file, it's not enough to run the application. This key bank, they used Linux containers. They used uh, Docker containers to package their applications. And Docker containers, they introduced a fundamental change. Now, this, if, if you think, if at, at this point, if up until now you thought that containers were just another cool thing that was going away, I have a very sad story for you. It's not, right? Con containers are the evolution of the operating system, period, right? The evolution of the operating system. And everything runs in operating system, both Windows or Linux. So I'm going to repeat this. Containers are the evolution of the operating system. So the question for this is not whether, uh, if you are going to end up adopting containers, but when. Where do you want to be in this adoption curve? Very similar to virtual machine. Some people thought, oh, my production database is never going to run on virtual machines. SAP is never going to run on virtual machines. We have people today, some people today, that are saying, ah, my production database is never going to run. Uh, on containers, and I am myself working for a very large customer to put their, all their production database inside containers, right? Um, so the advantage of the container model, as I said, is that the packaging model, and this is important, this may be a little bit too technical, but the packaging model of containers almost enforces teams to talk. Almost enforces. I don't want to say enforce because you can't force people, right? Uh, you, you, you may be able to force their, their actions, but not their minds. That's the problem with ideology, right? The packaging model makes people talk. Because in the same package, same package, you have now things that were once only responsibility of, of, of dev, dev, dev teams. And uh, once only responsibility of operations teams. So in the same package, remember, if just, just think that you are going to put something <coughs> to run, right? And you have a package. 
and before you have all the small packages. And the developer will deliver this small package to ops, and ops will have to figure out how to get this small package and put on top of the others, essentially layering my application. But with Linux containers and Docker, the package is both the application, the operating system, and the dependencies. Every single piece of dependency for your application other than the Linux kernel is inside that package. So now the result of the development process is a common language between operations and development. That's why I say that this change in technology is helping people and teams to talk, right? Because in order to make decisions on how to best define this container, this image, and to secure this, people have to talk. And the same uh, package that was tested, it's going to be the exact same thing that's going to be run in production, right? Because again, the software should be the, the same if you're you know, running either in test or QA. What, ha what changes is the environment where it's running. So again, the packaging model really helped this customer. It sounds like it was a five-year-old kid that draw this, but it's not. It was actually me. Uh, another very important thing is that I often will tell uh, operations that it worked on my machine, right? Now, how can I fix that as well, right? The, this customer in case key bank, they also ask their developers to have on their development machines the exact same software that was going to run their applications in production, right? Of course, a scaled down version of it without access to all the other integration points in their network that are key, but the tests that the developer were making and and the packaging that the web developer was making was in the same software that is running on the QA environment, that's running on the test environment, and that's running on the cloud environment. So that's the important thing, right? It, not only the technology is, is, is portable that allow you to have hybrid environments, hybrid means multi-cloud environments or, or on-premises and cloud, but it also allows you to run those applications uh, inside a developer machine, right? And I, I have to stress this because it's important. Again, technology is making people interact, right? So remember, uh, we're, we're telling a story about anxiety. So <clears throat> these are other, some other public references that have been using uh, containers and OpenShift for a while. There are others, right? Uh, the, for, for this, we have a very nice use case about them, but uh, it's been very big in, in financial services, um, uh, travel industry as well, retail. Uh, it's been very big. And it's been very, very big, Trump style, right? Uh, so so this, is, this is what we fix, and I'm about to finish my presentation. Uh, so sorry, this is what KeyBank fix, right? Developers will have, it worked on my machine, but then it didn't work in production. So the fact that you could have the same software running on your machine that was running in production, that helped very much with this. So it's different, right? It's, it's, not, um, it's not about no idea about production that works on my machine. <coughs> Now at KeyBank, of course, the developers, they kept making changes, right? but the changes, they were smaller. Right? And when changes are smaller, the changes, they break less things, right? because if you're making less, it's a mathematical thing. You have less, less, uh, less um, factors, you're going to have, you're gonna have like likely less variation. Right? Uh, and if, if the thing is that, well, ops or someone still has to fix, but now, due to the fact that I have uh, less changes, it's likely easier to fix. And my result is that anxiety level is okay, and I don't hate ops. Uh, I don't hate devs, I actually love them now. Um, it takes time, but that, that you get to this point. Now, <clears throat> this was of course very, very good for uh, their individual teams, right? But who you think also benefit from a company that has ability to push code to production once a week. And for some, uh, once, a week, once a week is not uh, fast enough. For some, it has to be minutes. It has to be days, right? So, and KeyBanks was one of the most uh, beneficiaries. And, and why is it important for KeyBank <coughs> to, this is another KeyBank slide. Uh, why was it important to KeyBank uh, I, I took the screenshot yesterday, to push changes into production once a week. Why do you think? Why it was important to become agile, to become more effective, to realize value faster? 
Well, it turns out financial services especially, they have a very interesting competition going on, right? And I want to end my presentation with this, is that if you are in financial services or pretty much any other industry, uh, retail industry is big, <laughs> it's huge. Even product companies, like I was seeing Unilever, right? That they now have, for, for, for pretty much every single product that they have, they have a competitor that specialized in that product, that's creating technology that specialized in that product. So these are all competitors to Wells Fargo, or pretty much to any bank, that fintechs that specialized in one service. And these guys, they are able to innovate fast, right? Because they have less constraints. It's a small, it's a small uh, area of the market they attack. And that's it. So remember, this is Wells Fargo. This is competition, right? So that's why we have to act and fast, right? Thank you very much.